It is, it is so good, man, to hear a body singing together. Um, a few of us went to the men's conference up at Thomas Road. Um, there were some good speakers there. But one of the most powerful things is when you listen to 5,000 men lifting up their voices to the Most High God. Men that are actually coming together because they have the intentionality to say, God, I'm in desperate need of you. I am not finished. I am not complete. I'm in need of you. I need your spirit to transform me. I need your spirit to have your way in me. I am not a man without you. Whatever concept of masculinity that I comprise without your word and without your scripture is my own doing. I need to look at your word to learn what masculinity truly is and what it means to be a man of God. It is just such an incredible thing. Um, and so thank you to the gentlemen that joined me uh, in doing that. Um, it was awesome. Um, okay, so if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 26. Um, just parking on this idea of, of, of masculinity and manhood. Um, you know, a church is only as strong as its men are strong. I heard one female say amen. <laughs> I mean, look, the reality is your church will never be strong if its men aren't strong. A family is only as strong as the, as the husband father is strong. There is no, there's no way around this. There's a reason why the, the attack on culture is to destroy the nuclear family. It's, try, it's trying to disrupt every bit of that. But a man is only as strong as a man can be when he has submitted and humbled himself before Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is nothing else. You cannot experience true manhood, men, until you have submitted to Jesus Christ. And that means in everything. There's not one area that, need, that is off limits to him. And one of the ways that this transpires, the way that this looks within, within a church body, and listen, I'm not saying this to put anybody down, but the reality is, the statistics are that women do more leading in ministry things than men do. Men just sit and abdicate the responsibilities within their home, within their church. We can complain all we want at the lack of men out there in our culture. But if we don't have men that are actually engaged and involved in one another's lives, and especially in kids' lives, discipling them and training them, this is what it means to be a godly man, that you're teaching the women and the, and the boys. This is what a godly man looks like, I'm telling you. You will never have a strong church. It's just, it's just the flat-out fact of it. Not because I'm just, you know, trying to drive this point home. It's because God said that's the way he set it up. And there's no way to get around it. We can ignore it. We can, we can just say, well, I don't want to hear that stuff. Just get on something else. Don't deal with me with my issues. Come on, pastor, get on somebody else. But the reality is, I was in that same boat for so long. Backseat Christian. Don't get me up front. I might have to talk to somebody. Just keep me in the back. I don't want to see anybody. Hopefully I can slip in and slip out. I don't have to interact with anyone. Now look where God put me. Put me in the front and I don't stop talking. But the reality is, look. All right. Let's just pray and close it out right now, Lord. No. Men are to be silent in the church. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm totally joking. <laughs> but the reality is, guys, look. The home was only as strong in my home when I started to step up and spiritually lead. It's only as strong. And the stats are overwhelming that the amount of children that leave Christianity is because even if there is a father in the home, many don't have fathers in the home, but when there is a father in the home, church is just a second, third type thing for them. It's never a priority. Coming together to just talk about scripture is never a priority. Praying together, praying over their children, never a priority. Did anybody grow up in a home where that was a priority? I didn't. There's a few but what happens when we actually do? I mean, the effects are profound. So we're going to look at a man today in Scripture who boasted in his strength. He boasted in his commitment to Jesus. But we saw what happens. We're going to see what happens when the man was focused on himself rather than on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Matthew chapter 26, we're going to pick this up. Last week, we talked about Jesus being in the garden. 
very significant, right, in what's going on within the garden. I hope that I was able to present and demonstrate Jesus was never trying to get out of going to the cross. When he says, let this cup pass from me, it wasn't Jesus' way of going like, man, this is really tough. I'd like to do something else. God, give me any other way. And that teaching, by the way, and like I said last week, I don't, I don't disparage anybody or, or, or put anybody down, but I just want us to realize the significance of this. When Jesus was speaking to Peter, well, to all of them, and he was saying what kind of suffering he was going to go through, what kind of death he was going to experience, and Peter gets up and says, by no means, Lord, this shall never happen to you. What does Jesus respond to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. So any ideas, concepts that diminish the lordship of Jesus or the work that he came to do are, find their origins to what? To the enemy. And when we look at the scriptures, we see Jesus told us this was going to happen. We've been in Matthew for a very long time. I understand it's hard to carry over each week. Like, that's why I've encouraged, uh, that's why I've encouraged us, hey, read ahead so you know what's coming up. Read behind where we've been. So it keeps the stuff fresh. Remember, these, these things were meant to be read all in one sitting. When Paul went out and taught, he would teach for hours and hours and hours. And it was even the one young man, he fell out of the third story window, that rascal. And he disrupted Paul's entire message. Paul goes down, and God gives him the ability to raise this young man from the dead. And they come back in. Paul wasn't done speaking, so he continued on. But there was a thirst and a hunger to understand the depth and the truth of God because they wanted transformation in their life. Paul uh, speaks of the Bereans, that, there was, that there, was, there was no one more noble than the Bereans. Why were the Bereans so noble? Do you all remember? It's because they studied the scriptures to find out what Paul was teaching, if it was actually aligned with God's word. So Paul would teach. They would then go home and study it for themselves and find out, is what Paul's saying actually true? And then they come back and say, Paul, we want some more. Give us some more now. We realize what you're saying is right. Now, all right, some more now. And he did this, and he says to them, like, these guys were unlike any other group that he came across. They, they were interested in knowing what is the context and the intention of, our, of the supreme author, the Holy Spirit, in putting this word together. They wanted their lives transformed. They didn't want to remain the same. They wanted it to be changed. And this is why, like we talked last week, that it's so critically important that the concepts that we have of God, that they have to be rightly aligned to his scripture. A finite being like you and me cannot understand the infinite being of God except that by which God reveals himself to us. It has to come by way of revelation. And then that revelation and conceptualization that we have has to be aligned with his word. That's why the psalmist says God exalts his word and his name above all things. Jesus says, sanctify them in truth. Your word, God, is truth. This, this is where our thinking is conformed to. Any other thing is wrong. And it's hard to say that, that yeah, to say amen to that. It's easy to say it in speech. It's very difficult to put that into practice. Because the scriptures, when we're honest, it actually reads us. It confronts us with something. It does something to us. And we can choose to stifle that, or we can choose to respond to it. And the encouragement is, beloved man, never quench the Holy Spirit. Man, the believer's life is predicated upon literally walking with the Holy Spirit hearing his voice, recognizing when he speaks, intimacy with the Most High God. This is what God, Jesus came to offer us, intimacy with God. And it took Peter a minute to get this. It took Peter a long while to understand this. He kept operating by his own strength and his own ability. Man, Jesus, far be it from you that you would have to go through that suffering. No, definitely not. Get behind me, Satan. Anything that diminishes Jesus' ministry, it's satanic. Its origin is from the enemy. 
Because if the enemy can make your God little to you, little, or relatable to you, in the aspect that I now, I I understand Jesus in this way because I can relate to that. When we start doing things like this, we, we, start, we start getting on the threshold of potential heresy. Now that seems maybe a little bit like, that's, that's a little, that's a little uh, extreme, Shane, don't you think? He gets us campaign. And you go like, they could actually put out a lot better imagery to understand that he gets us. Look, often I've heard when Jesus is in the garden that I can understand Jesus is trying to get out of going to the cross because I can relate to that. I can understand that. Listen, beloved, I don't want to relate to God. I want a God that can relate to me. I don't want to get to the point where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, Jesus is like me. No, no. I'm supposed to become like Jesus, right? Do, do you see the difference? These are subtle days. You go like, well, you're splitting hair, Shane. It's, it's these kind of hairs, though, that, that change everything the way that we think about God. And like we spoke last week, man, Unless our conceptualization of, of, of God is accurate, it's idolatry then. The essence, the very essence of idolatry, as Tozer says, is entertaining thoughts of God that are unworthy of him. What does that mean? That aren't true, that aren't accurate. Peter had to go through something pretty extreme to get him to have this heart change, this deep heart change within And it wasn't immediate. It took time. And this is this work of sanctification continually happening. So we have Jesus in the garden. We explained extensively last week that Jesus is not trying to get out of going to the cross. When this text is used to indicate Jesus is trying to look for another way, it's diminishing the incarnation of Jesus, why he even came. And we get this this reality here. Verse 43, 26 Chapter 26, verse 43, and he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus and at once, at once, and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must be so. And at that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And all the disciples left him and fled. Okay. So let's break some of this down. First off in this scene, we have Jesus coming out of, out, out of the prayer. Last week we looked at John 17 to see what, John, uh, what Jesus prayed before, moments before he went into the garden and prayed. Now we've got Jesus saying to his disciples, look, take your sleep another time. My betrayer is now at hand. And Judas said I was, he was going to give them a sign, that he would kiss the man. Now, this is very interesting because it's not like the chief priests and, the, and all these people didn't know who Jesus was. Jesus was rather a famous, a famous fellow. But it's something very interesting that Judas says, I'm going to kiss the son. I'm going to kiss the one that is, 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 is Jesus. 
I want us to look over in Psalm chapter 2. There's this interesting parallel here. Here is Judas betraying. Remember, Judas is, is filled um, with, with Satan at this point, right? The Bible says Satan entered into Judas to bring this to fruition. Um, Jesus talks about, when we looked in John 17, that Jesus prayed for his disciples. He lost none that were given to him. There was just one, the son of perdition, the one that was meant to, to do this in order that scriptures might be fulfilled, that someone was going to betray him. We saw the parallel a couple weeks prior with King David and one of his closest friends and advisors did the exact same thing when Absalom tried to usurp the throne from David. But remember, in Absalom trying to usurp, usurp the throne was because of his dad's inaction to his sister being raped. So it wasn't just like Absalom was going like, hey, I'm just going to throw daddy at, at, out of the throne because I want it. He was furious that his dad was complacent, apathetic to what happened to his sister, did absolutely nothing, being one of David's daughters as well. Complacency always leads to greater sin. The enemy looks for opportunities to make believers as complacent as possible. And one of the dangers for manhood is comfortability. If I'm comfortable, I really don't want to change anything I got going on. But something I, there was a theologian that read and listened to a while back, and he said something very interesting about the Holy Spirit. He said, the Holy Spirit is dangerous. The Holy Spirit is dangerous, but he's safe. Why is the Holy Spirit dangerous? What was he trying to convey and get across? Is he calls us to action. He puts us into things that aren't comfortable. He puts us into environments that aren't comfortable. He pushes us outside of ourselves. That's where the growth is at. It's, growth isn't in the comfortability. Growth isn't in the things that are just familiar. But are we really truly willing to follow Jesus wherever he sends us and leads us? And we go, we want to say yeah. But that begins right here in our families and in our church family. It starts right here. Jesus isn't sending you to say, hey, go out there and be a spokesman powerfully for my kingdom. Be, be, be a Billy Graham for me. If we're unwilling to even do anything right here, it's not like you go from, you know, zero miles an hour to 200 miles an hour in no time. There's this build, but he's going to take you outside of yourself. And it's interesting here what's going on with Judas. Judas is, is, is filled with the enemy. And the enemy is leading this, this charge against Jesus. There's like, there's, so not only is there a battle going on in the temporal, but there's a battle going on in the spiritual simultaneously. And it's easy for us to recognize the physical battle in present life and not the spiritual battle. The spiritual battle doesn't begin with just, let's get our state house to start functioning well. God doesn't skip the church house to fix the state house. He doesn't fix your house to fix the church house. Do you see how this works? There's an order here. And it starts with the men. It starts with the men. There's no way to get around this. Now, let's look at Psalm chapter 2 because this parallel of the attitude, the posture in which men and women, but men in particular, we are to take towards the Lord God and how this is twisted by what Judas does. Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. What is it saying? Let us be freed from God's law. Let us be relieved of it. We will create our own law. You see that happening out here? Okay. 
Do you see that happening in your own life? Because that's exactly what your flesh nature does. Let me push off the things of God and I'll create my own. I will make my own conceptualization of the Lord God. I will create my own reality around me. I will determine my own rules. I will determine my own what God sees fit and God doesn't see fit. It's easy for me to justify my own sin and the scripture says I'll do it. Yeah. You create a path that leads into destruction. You create a path that if God's not actually guiding our feet, and how does he say that he'll guide our feet? His word is a lamp to our feet. It will, and a light unto our path. We don't walk in darkness. This is why Paul says later on, you are not children of darkness. You, have, you are not, this is why he says later on, do not walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds, alienated from the life of God. This is not what you have learned in Christ, assuming that you've learned. You're not children of the darkness, but you are children of the light. Therefore, come out of the darkness. When Jesus to Nicodemus in John 3, I came into the world, the light came into the world, but the world loved its darkness more than it loved the light. Darkness is something we're going to naturally go to. And what this is, it does include like, oh, well, Shane, I don't do sin. I'm not running around in egregious sin. Remember, sin begins where? In the mind. And the most dangerous sin for any believer is crafting a God in their own image, in their own mind. This is what I think God ought to be like. Why? Because I can relate to him now. Uh, it, it makes sense to me. This is what the psalmist is saying. Not only do the rulers of the world do this, but we have to realize we also try to burst the bonds of Jesus, cut those things away. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So what is God saying? Man can reject the word of God. And he laughs. The arrogance and pride in man that we think we can reject the things of God and that it will come to pass. God's word will always come to pass. Amen? Amen. It will always, always come to pass. And notice his anointed in verse 2. We've got here in verse 6. He's talking about his king. This is messianic psalm. I tell of the decree, I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Y'all heard that somewhere before? <laughs> Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This has multiple Old Testament illustrations of this. God talks about when he is disciplining Israel, that he's going to use his rod of iron to correct them, to chastise them, to bring them back to a place of repentance and humility. See, Christianity begins with this premise of total humility. You understand the gospel is offensive. Has anybody ever been offended by the gospel? It's offensive, because what does it tell me? That I am a sinner and there's nothing I can do for myself. It tells me that, behold, there's nothing good in me. No, no, nothing. I don't really like hearing that. I remind my wife all the time about how lucky she is and how good she has it, get, get, catching such a guy like me. But apparently the scripture says something opposite. I don't wash my wife in that part of the word. I, I, we ignore that. I'm kidding. The, you know, the Bible says, husbands, wash your wives in the word. So if you're not actually doing that, husbands, you're breaking a command, okay? But, 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 but check this out. We are to actually be washing our wives in the word, and guess what happens with our wives? The wives respond when they see a godly man that they can follow. They naturally respond to that. They look at that and go, that is, that is a man that's following after the Lord. That's attractive. I want to follow that. 
It strengthens the bonds of marriage. Go figure. When we did the marriage study, um, there, were, there, there, were a few, there were a few of you about came to that. But one of the things we discussed and talked about, that any marital problem you're having is not a marital problem. It's a God problem. It's a God issue. And unless that God issue is straightened out, the marriage will not be fixed. You can't circumvent the most basic principles. It's like, it's, it's something that we do in Christianity. I'm guilty of doing this a lot. That I just want to try to ignore certain things and just, you know, harp on the things that I, that I got that keeps attention off of me, but I can point fingers at everybody else. And Jesus talked about this on the Sermon on the Mount, did he not? Quit worrying about the splinter in your brother's eye until you worry about the log in your own. The reality is the entire scripture is telling us your behavior isn't right. And you can never have right behavior because you're spiritually dead. And unless I bring you life, you will never have life. Do you, do you recognize in yourself that you are spiritually dead without God? That there is nothing, there is no life, there is no fullness, there is no joy, there is no peace, there is no real life in you without the Lord Jesus Christ. If you realize that, do you consistently seek him as though he can be found? Because guess what? He's calling. Jesus says, I stand at the door and what? And any that open the door to me, I will come in and do what? Eat with you, dine with you, dwell with you. The entire Christian walk is saying, Jesus is saying, look, there's nothing there's nothing you can do on your own for me. Nothing. Not even cast out demons. Not even good works. Not even feeding the poor. None of it. None of it can you do in me, for me, without me. It's not by my own strength. That's a hard thing like, to like really get. Because what is it doing? It's pushing me to a place of humility, is it not? It's pushing us to a place of humility that to realize, like, wow, there is nothing I can do apart from the Lord God. The Bible even says, what is man except the breath that's in his nostrils? Your heart stays beating. You're, you keep breathing because why? Because God allows us to. He completely, totally allows us to. Our body does this involuntarily. It's a subconscious act. Our brain just keeps the thing functioning. We can hold our breath. <laughs> I got one breath in me, and I can hold it, but eventually it's going to exhale. Why does man accept the breath that is currently in his nostrils? And the irony is we didn't even put the breath in our nostrils. Why, beloved, does God have you on the planet today? At any point in history, at any point in time, he could have planted you. Why today? Why now? Why in your family? Why with the people that you have in your life? What's the purpose that you, that you exist for? It's not just for your job and a retirement. There is eternal significance. One of, the, one of the things that was powerful in one of the speakers at the men's conference is like, he doesn't want to get to the end of his life and realize he wasted it pursuing things that didn't matter. And that isn't, that isn't a job. Remember, it's not a job. There is no bifurcation, there's no separation between what is holy work and what is secular work. The Bible says whatever you set your hand to do, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might as though you're doing it unto the Lord. There's no one profession that's more holy than another one. There's, none, there's not one that's more eternally significant than another one. Because no matter where God has placed you, no matter how God has gifted you, it's for a purpose for his kingdom work. Do we believe that? So that means that our lives, no matter what job we have, has eternal significance. But what can happen is we can get comfortable, get complacent, become apathetic, and we lose perspective of why we're here or what we're here to do. The purpose of why God has actually put life in us. We can do all we want to try and break against God's words and God's ways, but his way will be done. 
Verse 7, I will tell you of a decree. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your, your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So what is the scripture saying? It's teaching us this posture that we are supposed to come to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and we have been created to kiss his face. But the betrayer came and kissed the face of the son. For what purpose? Not to recognize the Lordship of Christ to turn him over for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a dead slave, according to the Old Testament. Beloved, we can do the same things in our lives. We can approach the sun and kiss his face and then turn around and cut down every single person around us. James asks, how is this possible that the same tongue that we use to glorify and praise God is the same tongue that we use to cut everyone else down around us? Do you not know that there is power of life and death in your tongue? So use it wisely. The betrayer is not kissing the face of, of the son because he is submitting to his lordship. He's kissing the face of the son for profit. We too, beloved, ought to come to kiss the son's face in reverence. Not simply say, kiss his face so we can live however we want. There is a transaction that takes place with Christ. And if you are truly part of Christ, you're never the same. You're never the same. You're not a better version of yourself. There is a, there is a, there's a full transfer that happens. And something else begins stirring up within you. And I'm not talking about just filling up with Bible knowledge. I'm talking about you can take the Bible and you study it. You divide it ab about. You, you, you get into it for what purpose? To allow the scripture to change you. That's a desire that you have. Change me, oh God. I don't think right. I don't live right. I don't believe right. I need your spirit. I can't understand anything of your word unless your spirit teaches it to me. That's scripture. So I cannot come to the scripture with my own all my degrees, I can't come to the scripture and go, I've got, this, I've got this thing figured out. I can give you archaeological background, apologetics arguments, I can give you all these different things, but it, that, that, those facts will never change anything about me. Just like just you learning Bible knowledge, putting scripture to memory, will never change anything about you unless you begin working with the Holy Spirit, saying, fix everything wrong with me. I'm spiritually dead. Have your way in me. Peter hasn't done this yet. What do we see Peter do? Peter is fulfilling what he said prior. Lord, all the rest of them, all the rest of them, they're going to fail you. They will fail you, but not me. I'm even willing to go and die for you. And we see Peter do just that. There's probably a few hundred guards there that come to acquire Jesus. And it's very bizarre, like we read last week, when Jesus, when they ask, hey, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, and he says, I am, and they all, what? Fall down. They all fell, they get back up, and Jesus says, whom do you seek? I don't know if they ask timidly at this point, but you would kind of think, humanly speaking, there would have been a little timidity there. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth? What just happened when, when, he, when Jesus said, I am, they all fell, they asked, he asked them the question again, whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Why do you come to me with swords and clubs? Day after day, I taught openly. 
I was in the synagogues. I was in the temple. I hid nothing. I do nothing in the shadows. I am of the light. This is why Paul says you are not children of the darkness. Come into the light. Isolation always leads to sin. This is one of the greatest significance within a church body. We isolate ourselves. We want no interaction with anyone else around us. And that allows opportunity to breed all sorts of things. And they typically aren't holy. Everything Jesus did was in the public. It was an open, it was an openness. He had his disciples around him. We go, well, that's Jesus, Shane. Whom are we to reflect, beloved? Not myself or my own conceptualization of what I think it ought to be. I am supposed to be transformed more and more into the image of Christ. That's what he has predestined you to become. But you can't do that on your own. It requires, number one, the Holy Spirit to do it within us. Number two, it requires a body of believers around us to do what? Hold us. Oh, that dirty accountable word. I don't want accountability. Let me just be my own self. I'll put on the Jesus face when I'm around everybody, but in private, I'll watch what I want to watch, do what I want to do, listen to what I want to listen to, because it's all about me. God knows my heart. Oh, man, beloved, this is... Do not accept cultural Christianity, this American complacent Christianity. There is such life. When you read, and we'll eventually get to the books of Acts, and you see how the early church began began functioning and operating with one another, all of us, when we read that, we go, that is beautiful. I would love to experience that. There's not a single Christian I've talked to, hey, what do you think about the church in Acts? Oh, it's amazing. It's phenomenal. Oh, I want to. I would so love to have been there and experienced that. You know what the only thing that's preventing us from experiencing that today? We're not doing it. It's us. The spirit hasn't changed. The same transformation, the sanctification process hasn't changed. The life aspect of the Holy Spirit hasn't changed. But this is what happens. We start doing everything on our own accord. We even do church on our own accord. We do our worship on our own accord. We do it all by our own strength and power. And this is what, I've mentioned this before, as as Tozer has said, man, like 90% of what happens in the New Testament church, it would all cease if the Holy Spirit left. But 90% of what we do today in church would continue to operate and function if the Holy Spirit left. We have prayed for decades for revival. Generation after generation, begging and pleading God for revival. Do you think God is deaf? Why has revival not come? He does, he's not interested. He doesn't care. He wants to all go to turmoil. I mean, in fact, Jesus says, hey, before my return, it's going to be it's going to be like hell. Well, we just got to let it go to hell then for Jesus to come. Why has God not answered that prayer? Prayed by millions for generations. I can tell you, beloved, because we have replaced obedience with prayer. God even says in the Old Testament, when sacrifices and everything were laid on the altar, that I desire obedience over sacrifice. This is why we we talked about before, in the Hebrew language, there is no word for obey. It comes from the Hebrew word Shema, which means to listen. A derivative, Simon, Shimon, it's a derivative of Shema. So there's a play going on with Peter. Remember, it is, Peter, we'll get to that in a second. But there's this interaction that is going on. Shimon is meant to be, you are to hear and to repeat the things that you hear. You can't very well repeat the things that you hear if you're asleep, Peter. Why are you sleeping? Pay attention. Your spirit's willing, but your flesh nature is weak. Pay attention, Peter. You cannot repeat the things that I tell you to do when you're falling asleep. Peter, I told you, the enemy is coming to sift you like wheat, sift you hard. Remember, we talked about it's this violent shaking. He's going to do everything he can to do what? Jesus literally says, for it to destroy you. But I have prayed that your faith will not fail. And when you... When you return, when you epistrepho, when you repent, when you come back to me, because you're going to fall, Peter, when you come back to me, strengthen your brothers. But notice what happens here in the garden. 
Peter is fulfilling what he said he would do. Oh, man, I'm willing to fight and die for you, Lord. He cuts off one of the priest's servant's ears. We realize in the Gospel of John that John, his family, somehow knew the high priest's family. There was some connection there. But the Gospel of John points this out. This is why they're able to go further into the court as they follow Jesus. And this is also why John knows this servant's name, that his ear was cut off. And we see this example take place. Peter was wise not to strike one of the Roman officers because that would have been certain death for him. He, was he selective in what, what he went to strike or was it just the closest thing near him? Don't know, but we do know this. We see Peter's raw emotion character of who he is. There's hundreds standing before Jesus, and this man pulls out one little sword and is like, bring it on. <laughs> this is certain death, but bring it on. I'm willing to die for you. Put away your sword, son. Don't you know I can't call 12 legions of angels? And they would come, they would deliver me from this moment, but how would Scripture be fulfilled if I did that? And we see what transpires here. Let, let's, let's continue moving forward. The very end of verse 56 is critical. <coughs> excuse me. It says, Then all the disciples <coughs> excuse me, left him and fled. They all fled. Just like he talked about earlier in, uh, in, uh, in this chapter. That all of you will, will leave me. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered, and Peter was following him at a distance. That's where we often like to follow Jesus, is at a distance. We want a little bit of Jesus in our life. We don't really want it all. Because if we did, that might cost me something. So let's just be comfortable. I'll follow him at a distance. As far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. The Gospel of John points out that John knew the guards and somehow knew the high priest, so that's what allowed them to go into the court of Caiaphas. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found what? None. Though, though many false witnesses did indeed come forward, at, le at last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Did Jesus say that? Not quite that way. He said, destroy this temple and in three days, he will raise it up. He didn't say, I'm going to destroy the temple mount. He said, destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. And John gives us clarity of what Jesus meant by that. He was talking about the temple of his body. Destroy this body, and in three days I will raise it up. But remember, it's false witnesses coming to make false accusations. Has anybody ever been falsely accused of anything? Is it not one of the most aggravating things ever? Why does it feel so personal? Because it is personal. They're attacking your very character, your integrity, your honor. And it's extremely aggravating. So we can all relate to this point, false testimony being, being brought against him. And the high priest, verse 62, and the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. I'm going to pause here just for a second. Last week we looked at Isaiah 53. Go back to Isaiah 53 because some of this is beginning to be fulfilled right in front of us again. So Isaiah 53, we see within um, this particular part with Jesus remaining silent. Look here in 50, Isaiah 53, verse 7. He is going to be the anointed one, the Messiah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, he opened not his mouth. Jesus is going as the propitiation for our sins. He is going as the atonement. Remember, what is this night right now that's going on? 
in G at this point. What did Jesus just celebrate with his disciples? Passover. Jesus is going as the Passover lamb to the cross. For what purpose? To be sacrificed, just like a Passover lamb was to be sacrificed. And we're going to get to this. We're actually going to see Jesus is sacrificed on the cross at the same hour that the lambs were sacrificed at the temple. Jesus is fulfilling all of this right before their eyes. And verse 7 there in Isaiah 53 is talking about that he remains silent when these charges are being brought against him. People are going to assume Jesus must be guilty of whatever he's going through because there's no way an innocent man would go through what he's going through. If he truly is God, let him call a God and rescue him. Bring him down from that cross. Remember, Paul says later on, look, if the rulers of this age knew what they were doing, they never would have crucified Christ. They never would have allowed this to happen. They would have tried to prevent it every single way that they could. And remember the irony. When they, when they paid Judas the 30 pieces of silver, they took the, te the money from the treasury in the temple. The currency in the temple was used to, buy, to purchase sacrifices. Do you see the irony here? Like, they don't even realize what they're doing. They're purchasing the sacrifice of God, uh, the Passover lamb of God, to place him upon an altar for him to sacrifice himself. They purchased him with money from the temple to do it, but they saw his value was worth 30 pieces of silver. He was worthless. He was as youthful as a dead slave. Look at Judas' attitude. I'm going to go and kiss the son to show you which one is actually him. Betraying Psalm, 30, uh, Psalm 2. This conflict that is arising is not just in the temporal, it's in the spiritual. This is crazy what's happening before everybody's eyes, and they're missing it. Just like in our lives, God could be actively operating right in front of us, and we miss it. Because we're not interested in hearing his voice. We don't want to know if his spirit is present or doing anything. We're not asking him, Lord God, change me. Make me a different man. Make me a different woman. I do not want to remain the same. I am dead, and without your spirit, I have no life. I have a friend. I have a friend, and if you knew this man, this is not a man that seeks attention, that looks for any sort of audience, that even likes to be in front of people. He spoke at our wedding, and he was super nervous doing that. He does not want any attention on him whatsoever. And this man was on a flight with his wife. And they were flying. I forget where they were flying to. I think they were going to see, see one of their grandkids. And there's an emergency that happens on the plane. The pilot comes on. He says, hey, is there a doctor on board? And that call goes out a few times. And my buddy is sitting there in his seat, buckled like every good passenger should be. And he like leans up and looks back, and there's some commotion going on in the back of the plane. And he's and he's wondering what you know. I wonder what's happening. And the call started standing more urgent. Is there a doctor? Is there a doctor? And he told me. He told me the story. He had to write it all down after this took place. This is not the kind of man that would make a story like this up. I'm telling you, he wants zero attention brought to himself. He said, something compelled him. No one told me to do this. No one asked me to do this. I didn't hear a voice. I was just compelled. I unbuckled my seatbelt and started walking to the back. He is not a doctor. He's an excavator operator. Okay? He does really great work with dirt. He has no, knows nothing of the medical. So he starts walking towards the back. His wife, what are you doing? You're not a doctor. I just feel like I'm supposed to go for some reason. And he walks to the back of the plane. And he finds out, he sees this man. This man's totally blue. They've got him out, and he's just laid. He's totally blue. Clearly, the dude died. Something happened, probably a heart attack or something along that. Well, there happened to be some nurses on the plane. There's a nurse back there with them doing the CPR, doing everything they can to keep him going. He comes walking to the back. They're relieved. Are you a doctor? No. But I, I, know, the, I know one. And he see, the man's wife like, is up and out talking to him. And he said, you know, what happened? I forget the man's name now, but my husband just had a heart attack. And, and um, he's like, well, 
I can pray. You want to pray? And the wife's like, oh, we're, we're believers. That would be wonderful. Yes, please, please pray with me. He didn't touch the man. He didn't do it. He's standing in the aisle way, and he just prays with the wife, and he says, Lord, you're with us at 50,000 feet doing three, 400 miles an hour. You're with us in this plane as you are anywhere else. God, would you touch this man? Um, and if it be your will, would you, would you heal him, bring him, keep him here? And he said, Shane, I watched life come back into this man. He was blue, and he watched the color start coming into his skin from his top of his head. And you could just tell, like, that's really bizarre. The man whew, came back. And he, I never forgot what he told me. The man said, whew, I feel better. <laughs> I guess you would. <laughs> and what's wild about this, so my buddy, he collected cars, a big Ford fan, and this guy that died was a lead designer at Ford. So they get to talking, like, oh, man, you know, they just get to chit-chatting and stuff. And he goes back to his chair and sits back down, and he is just bawling. And he just starts writing out it on his phone. That's all he could do. But he said what was amazing about the story, he's like, Shane, God just showed up in a powerful way. I said nothing special. I didn't do anything. I don't even know what compelled me to go back there. But God just did this incredible work, and he said everyone sitting around was totally oblivious. He's like, I've never seen the Twilight show, but he, he referenced it. It was like being in the Twilight Zone. Where like all this incredible work was happening and everybody was just like plugged into their own. They had their earphones in. They were on their screens. Their... No one realized anything that happened that an act of God just happened. And everyone missed it. Except the wife, the husband, and the nurse that was with them. That's an incredible miracle that took place. From a man, I'm telling you, if you all knew this man, he would, he would not make this kind of stuff up. But it was totally missed that God was at work, that God was moving around them. I'm sure there were other believers on the plane, at least those that profess. The significance is not the miracle, because for God to do a miracle, it's really not that big of a deal. Amen? I mean, God can do miracles pretty easily. The inc what's incredible is that God is looking to always be active in our lives, but we desire it not. That's more amazing to me. And when I get into this conversation with people, is God still doing miracles? Does he still do this? Anybody who believes in, in the cessation of gifts, they do not get that from Scripture. They've heard that from a teacher somewhere. And my biggest challenge back to, has God really ceased doing every, anything that he wants to do? I ask the question, are lives still being trained? Is the addict still being delivered? Is the, the person in bondage to pornography, to adultery, to whatever it is, are chains being broken? God is every day. That is the power of God that does that. It's the power of God. God is still at work in our lives. But so often we try to go about it in our own strength and our own ability. And Peter is not yet understanding what's going on. So Jesus, Jesus has brought before the high priest. He's brought before the council. All sorts of testimonies coming against them. They find what? No fault in him. Why is this significant that he's brought before the high priest? Because the high priest represents all the Jewish nation under God. Does that make sense? What must the Passover lamb, according to Exodus 12 have happened to it. It must be inspected and found without spot or, blem or blemish, that it must be found blameless. And now he's standing before the chief of the Jewish people being found blameless. And look what happens next. Now, now the high priest, not realizing that Isaiah 53 is being literally played out in front of him, in fact, Caiaphas even prophesied earlier 
It's interesting, the Gospel of John points this out, that it was actually Caiaphas that said earlier in Jesus' ministry when the Pharisees and chief priests are all up and they're all getting ruffled, we got to stop this man. And the high priest that says he prophesied, he did not say this of his own account, but the Spirit says through him, one man must die for the sake of the nation. He didn't realize he was saying something prophetic that was going to happen. So now it's being fulfilled. This, this verb, these words that he said earlier in Jesus' ministry, they're now coming to fulfillment at this point. Jesus is now fulfilling what is required of the Passover lamb. He's been inspected. His triumphal entry when he comes into, into Jerusalem to Passover is four, it's four days. Four days, Jesus has been inspected exactly like how the Passover lamb was supposed to be inspected. On the 10th day of the first month, the Passover lamb is selected. They inspect it for four days to make sure it's without spot or blemish. And then they slaughter it on the 14th day. It is a Passover. The day that follows Passover is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which goes for seven days. And then the first... The first day of the week following the Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread is called the Feast of First Fruits. You're going, that was a whole lot of information you just threw at me. What's the significance? It's because literally every one of the feasts in the Bible are prophetic to the Messiah. They point to Jesus. So why does Christianity adopt things that have nothing to do with Jesus, but we, and we reject the things that do have to do with Jesus? Why? Because it's the ways of man. I will decide how I will worship God, and God knows my heart, and so he'll just receive it. We, we take this approach constantly. And the irony, just to show the connection on this point right now, the irony, what's coming up on March 31st? Easter, right? No surprise to us. When is Passover? April 22nd. So we literally know the day when Jesus is crucified. You count three days forward, you know when Jesus resurrected. It's April 25th. Why is Easter happening on March 31st? That's interesting, isn't it? If it's supposed to be about the resurrection, where do we come up with this Easter business? Well, you look into all that, and it gets pretty dark. But the reality is the reason why Christianity celebrates Easter is because the Catholic Church decided at the Nicene Council, some good things they decided there for the doctrine of Christianity, they also decided, you know what, we're going to make Easter and bring this about. We're going to blend the pagan holiday, put it in with the resurrection, and we're just going to go along with it, and they fixed the set of dates in which it would happen. Not going by when it actually happens, but what was convenient and comfortable and, you know, understandable. So this year, it just happens to play out like, isn't that ironic? Literally almost a month before it actually happens, and when you look it up, hey, why is Easter on March 31st this year? Literally, I, I looked this up just to see, like, what, you know, articles and things say. It says because... Christians didn't keep track of the resurrection, so we don't actually know when it happened. Like, bro, it's literally right there written for us. What are you talking about? We don't know when it happened. But this is what happens. But beloved, I'm t like, oh, what I'm trying to drive home in these, in these past multiple messages, we create and fashion a religion around the God that we have fashioned and created in our minds. And we will call him God, call him Jesus, do whatever we want to do. I don't think when we do that, it's coming from evil hearts. I believe it's coming from sincere hearts, but this is the importance of why we turn to the scriptures and say, God, is the way I worship you and honor you and serve you, is it in conformity to what you have revealed? Not what I just want to think or believe. Do you see the, the posture that's different there? So Jesus is standing before them, and it's totally silent. He's not saying a word. Now Jesus will speak, because what does the high priest do? I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Over here in Isaiah, Isaiah 50, it talks about this talks about this exact thing that's going to take place. 
Isaiah 50, verse, verse 6. It talks about the sin of Israel, but the obedient servant of God and what the servant of God is going to do. God's anointed. In, in Isaiah 50, verse 6, it says, I gave my back to those who strike. What's going to happen to Jesus? His back is about to be scourged, right? He's about to go through a beating. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. And what? I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. The scriptures are being fulfilled in front of them. They're literally carrying it out. And they see it not. It says, now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. This is a totally different Peter than what we just saw moments ago, right? Pulling out a sword, taking on a couple hundred. All right, buddy, let's go. One at a time. Come on up. Now we're seeing a totally different Peter. You were a follower of his. I am not. What happens when this happens in our workplace? Aren't you a Christian? Uh, well, um, uh, do, you see what, do you see the parallel? It starts taking place here. I, 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 don't, I, don't know what they're to, I don't know what you mean. Verse 71, and when he went out to the entrance, another server, uh, uh, servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. So now his intensity is getting even greater. He was sitting around a fire, according to the Gospel of John. They were sitting around a fire. That's significant because of the transformation we'll see in Peter. Puts him back around a fire. And, 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 and you know Jesus. You're a follower of his. No, I'm not. And so then he left. I better, get, I better start making my way kind of out of here. I need to get away from this. And he stands at the entrance of the courtyard. You're a follower of Jesus. You're one of his. I swear by God I am not. He's beginning to make an oath. I, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are, are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. You know what's interesting about the Gospel of Luke, the detail it pulls up here? Peter's standing in the court. He's looking what's happening to Jesus. When he started seeing what's happening to Jesus, Peter's attitude changed and became afraid. Now he's like, ooh, I, ooh, that's bad. All the counsel's coming against him. They're holding a council at night, which is against the Jewish law. They're seeking false testimony in order, and now they're, in order to condemn him to death, and now they're calling for his death, and Peter's like, uh-oh, this has gotten real. Never mind, I'm not ready to take on a band of soldiers. I'm now frightened. I'm going to now try to uh, deny, like, get away. It's the same thing that our flesh natures will do. We want to say, boy, if we were to face persecution and difficulty, I'd stand up for Jesus. Would you really? What happens when you stand up for Jesus in your job? What happens if you stand up for Jesus in your family? What happens if you stand up for Jesus in your own life? It means your flesh nature has to be crucified. Because our own flesh nature is at enmity with God. It resists everything that God is doing. And we're seeing the flesh nature come out in Peter now. We see the flesh nature. No longer he's going, I'm so big and strong, I'm going to fight them all off. Where now his flesh nature is coming up. And remember what Jesus said to him. There is something coming your way, a temptation that's going to be so strong, it's going to wreck you, Peter, and you're going to fall on your face. I am willing to go to death for you, Jesus. I won't fall. These other, these other chumps may fall, but not me. Not me. I will stand firm and stand strong. Peter, listen, they're in the garden. I told you what was to come, and I'm giving you three hours to pray about it, but you keep falling asleep. You're not paying attention. Your f spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Can any of you testify how weak your flesh nature is? I absolutely can testify to that. So then why in the world do we keep clinging to it so much? We didn't all have to let part of ourselves die. It's easy. American Christianity is easy. It's, it's so easy, so many claim it. And Jesus literally said, 
early in the Gospel of Matthew, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is truly one of mine. In the book of Malachi, when they paid attention to what God was instructing, instructing the priest, he literally said to the priest, this sacrifice you bring to my altar, it's as dung to me. I'm going to take the dung and smear it in your face. I asked you for one thing. I asked you to train up godly offspring, and yet you've refused to do it. So see, I have cursed you. Indeed, I've already cursed you. You have corrupted what the priesthood is. You can't blame the people, priests. You taught them to behave this way. What's different in today is we are literate. We can read. We can listen to whatever teachers we want to listen to. We can listen to whatever our itching ears want to hear. We can follow after whatever we want to follow because people can absolutely corrupt the text. This is why, this is why I've said to you countless times, beloved, study the scriptures and find out if what I'm saying is actually true. It's why we go verse by verse through the Bible. Using the Bible to interpret the Bible because what is required of us, it's a lesson that took me many years to get even though I was saved and I was following after Christ. It took me many years to understand every bit of me has to die. There's not a single part of me that is permittable or accepted in heaven. None of me. It's all got to go. And it took me years to get that. Years. 17, actually. But I could preach the scriptures. Prayer does work. But the scriptures weren't changing me. I could tell you what you needed. I could tell you what God could do for you. I could flip all through here. Where do you want to go? Let's talk about it. But it was doing nothing in the person of my, of my heart. We can put on the mask as long as we want. But the reality is, God says, there's nothing of you that is permitted in my presence. All of it's got to go. But the exchange that I give you is unlike anything you will ever, ever experience. I don't give the way the world gives. I give you my life. I give you my peace. I give you everything that I am, that you and I can abide together, and the Father will come and abide, the Spirit will come and abide, and the four of us will abide together. It's life. And when you encounter God, you're never, ever, ever the same. You don't even want the old stuff anymore. You don't want the flesh nature to come up. You want it all gone. But American Christianity has taught something that you, all you have to do is repeat a prayer and you're good to go. Have at it. You got, you're rescued from hell. Have fun. Just be a good person. Be, cuss a little less, drink a little less, whatever it is. Just do a little less of whatever you used to do. Do some good stuff. And we got to sit around and wait for the rapture to happen. It's coming. And boy, it's going to get real bad before, before Jesus returns. We just got to let it happen. I mean, it's just got to go to pot. That's just the way it is. But you, you are a good person. American Christianity has taught us something that it doesn't cost us anything to follow Jesus. That idea is totally foreign to the Bible. It is a lie. And in my opinion, anything that diminishes the lordship of Jesus is from the enemy. Exactly what Jesus said would happen in Matthew 13, that the demonic would make their nests inside the churches in order to confuse people and deceive people right to their own destruction. This is why I say to us over and over, beloved, man, don't just take my word for what this thing says. Study it yourself. And if it is true, if what I'm calling us and encouraging us to, ask God to make that real in your life. Make it real. Don't be satisfied with whatever you've experienced with God. I know some of y'all have experienced incredible things with God. Don't be satisfied with that. Like, boy, that was sure good 30 years ago. Oh, I remember. Boy, it was so good. It was so great. Your best times are yet to come. Amen? 
is still yet to come. Peter is still at this point relying on his own strength. The Gospel of Luke points out, as Peter is in the court, he can see Jesus and what was going on. The Gospel of Luke says that when when Peter denied Jesus the third time, it says Jesus turned and looked at him. And Jesus began to weep bitterly. I don't think the look of Jesus was like, ah, told you so. This stupid disciple just doesn't get it. I told him what was going to happen, and he just, he just doesn't get it. I don't think it was that look at all. This is after the man's been struck, his, weird, his beard's been ripped out, and spit on everything. He turns and he looks at Peter. I guarantee you those were eyes of compassion. They were eyes of utter compassion, not you miserable failure. It was eyes of compassion. I told you, son. Now when you return, strengthen your brothers. And it overwhelmed Peter. But that emotional experience didn't change him yet. It still didn't change him. And we'll get to this point in the Gospel of Matthew. But Jesus puts Peter back around a fire. The same type of thing where, Jesus, where Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus is going to put him around a fire and ask him three questions. The same question three times. Do you love me? We're going to see this, this conversation. And Jesus is asking him, Peter, do you love me? Oh, I love you. Yeah, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? <laughs> yeah, I love you. I got to see the transfiguration. I'm the only dude that walked on water. These other chumps didn't do it. Although this time, when he sees Jesus on the shore, he doesn't walk on water. He jumps in and starts swimming. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? And it says, it pierced Peter. And it says, Lord, you know all things. We're going to get to what happened in that third time that transformed this man. We see Peter changing from a reactionary person to a responder. He no longer acts out of his flesh nature, and we catch a glimpse of this in Acts chapter 2. The change, the transformation, what actually took place in Peter but the work wasn't finished in Peter. The work continued. As you, that's what's so beautiful about this New Testament. You see the frailty of all of its heroes. That all of its heroes had to die to themselves in order that God's strength can live in them. Beloved, you keep walking your Christian life under your own strength. It will be as powerless and dead as you've experienced. But if you start allowing the Holy Spirit and, and, and asking him to move within you, to churn up his spirit within you, it will be like anything you've ever experienced. And you'll actually have something worthwhile sharing with others. You will see a peace in your life. You will see a joy in your life. You will see a confidence in your life. Guess what starts to happen to fear and doubt? Because where there is perfect love, it casts out all fear. And when that love of God begins welling up within you, you're never the same. You start going, wow, I didn't know this was possible. It doesn't mean that you don't fall on your face sometimes. It doesn't mean that you're not tempted. It doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes. But you start seeing that there is a transformation that takes place within, and you're never the same. And you've got something life-changing now to offer other people. Rather than saying, let me tell you about him, you can say, come and see. The very words that Jesus said to his disciples, come and see. Amen? Father, God, we glorify you, we praise you, and we recognize that your word is absolute truth. We are to be sanctified in your truth. And God, it's so difficult sometimes, because even when I'm up here talking about these things, it's, it's, uh, it's penetrating my heart and it's sanctifying me. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you continue your work among us. That you have your way among us. And that you do what only you can do within us. God, I pray that as, as many of us are soon about to leave and go and carry on about our business and plans, I pray.
pray, God, that we reflect upon your words. Anything that was of me, let it be forgotten. But may whatever you have spoken, may it be um, swirling around in their minds, stirring up within their minds and their conversations wherever they're going, meditating upon your word, listening to your spirit. Because in you there is life. In us there is only death. And you've offered us a transference. God, help me help us never to neglect that transference. It's in Jesus' covenant name we pray. Amen.